Oh wait, no, the laptop's right there, I mean. <coughs> Genius. <laughs> Starting off the news this week, a story that isn't actually from this week, but we didn't cover it when it did happen, so here it is. Irandel, the farthest known star in our universe, has been classified as a massive B-type star. It is believed to be a very different body from our own sun, twice as hot and nearly a million times more luminous. Irandel was only discovered last year in images taken by the Hubble telescope and has since attracted the attention of the newer James Webb Space Telescope to further analyse the 12.9 billion year old image. Given this evolving information about Irandel, astronomers believe, similar to other stars like it, it likely has a companion star. It is unlikely that we will be able to detect a clear second body, though astronomers believe they may be able to see hints of it in the images of Irandel we have so far. And in other news, following the failed landing of Russia's Luna 25 spacecraft earlier this month, India's space agency has successfully landed their craft, Chandrayaan-3, very close to the south pole of the moon today, becoming the first craft to do so. While the moon is generally not the smoothest surface, the south pole presents itself as a particularly difficult landing zone for any potential spacecraft, being covered in boulders and craters that act as further obstacles in what is already a mammoth task in landing something on the moon. The spacecraft that has joined those human objects already on the lunar surface today carries a six-wheeled rover that will send crucial and unique data back to Earth. It is hoped that this mission may be able to find ice which could help future plans for human settlement on the moon. And now I'll hand you over to Ben with some news about an old friend of ours. Thanks Doug. Now I'm starting off my section this week in a very different way, but I wanted to talk about this. On Friday the 18th of August, the orca known as Tokate sadly passed away in the Miami Seaquarium after having been kept there for over 50 years. She was captured and torn away from her mother in Penn Cove, Washington State in 1970 and thought to be 57 years of age when she died. She had been suffering from a gastrointestinal issue for a couple of days, which was being treated and then suddenly developed acute renal failure, from which she was unable to recover. Over the years, many people had advocated for her release and this dream looked to be within her reach. With new owners taking over Miami Seaquarium and a generous donation from Jim Ursay, owner of Indianapolis Colts, progress was being made, with the hope that she would be released into a sea pen in her native waters next year. On the 17th of August, as she was struggling for her life, the pod of orcas that were her family, L Pod, met up along the west side of the San Juan Islands with other pods that make up the endangered population of southern residents. L Pod remained in the area on the 18th as she passed away. L Pod is led by a matriarch called Ocean Sun, who is thought to be her mother. Large gatherings of orcas known as superpods are actually known to meet, seemingly as a cultural or social ritual, to mark a significant event in their community, such as a birth or a death. Some people have thought that, even though they were on the other side of the continent, perhaps they were gathering in order to greet Tokate home. It is certainly an interesting coincidence and a nice thought. Tokate had shown such strength of character during her time in captivity that I truly believe she would have survived a transfer to her home waters to spend her last remaining days in relative freedom. Sadly, this was not to be. For me at least, her captivity is a symbol of everything that is wrong with humanity, our total disregard for other life forms on this planet and the belief by many that in some way we are superior beings and that the world and its resources are only there for us to consume in some way. But she was also a beacon of hope for many people who wanted to put right the wrongs committed against her species, and it was just within grasp. Emotions of the many people who loved her from all around the world run deep. She leaves a void in people's hearts that will take a long time to heal. I send my thoughts and love to those who had the honour of actually knowing her, they must be devastated, and also to others who, like me, followed her story from a distance and grew to love her from afar. She is now, in a way, free, and I sincerely hope that her spirit is swimming with her beloved pod in the beautiful waters of her home. Thank you to my mum for writing this section of the video, she'd been following the Tokate story for a long time, and she's actually made a couple of videos about her captivity and planned release over on her channel One World. She's been absolutely heartbroken by the news of Tokate's passing, who she felt a very personal connection with, so please do go over to her channel and send her your love, I know she'd really appreciate that. 
Also, a big thank you to the wonderful people of Langley Whale Centre on Whidbey Island in Washington, who we visited in person a couple of weeks ago and who gave us these wristbands in support of Tokate. They had been quite personally involved in the planned release, and I'm very sorry for your loss. Moving now to the paleontology news, first up this week there's been a very exciting paper describing a unique new kind of both dinosaur and pterosaur relative. This new species, named Venetoraptor gassinae, was found in Upper Triassic rocks in Brazil and is a kind of reptile called a Lagopetid. Lagopetids are a lineage of what are termed pterosaur precursors, traditionally being thought to represent a very early line of dinosauromorphs, though more recent work shows they are likely to be pterosauromorphs instead. Venetoraptor preserves one of the more complete skulls of a Lagopetid found so far, and also has a good deal of the body skeleton too, most notably the forelimbs. This newly named species looks really quite bizarre, with a sharp, raptorial beak at the front of the skull, as well as relatively big hands with four large digits bearing long scythe-like claws. The evolution of a beak not only predates beaks appearing in dinosaurs by 80 million years, but also increases the known diversity of pterosauromorph beak structures, showing that early dinosaur and pterosaur precursors were far more ecologically disparate than we'd previously appreciated. The exact function of this beak in Venetoraptor itself is uncertain, but it does look very similar to the raptorial beaks of modern birds, suggesting that perhaps it was being used to tear into flesh, or maybe for eating tough fruits. The forelimbs are very intriguing too, clearly being specialised for some kind of interesting behaviour. They're relatively very large for the body size of this animal, which is about a metre in total length, and are unusual in that the fourth digit is actually the longest one in the species whereas in other Lagopetids, it's usually the shortest one. The large hands with these sharp claws seem to indicate that Venetoraptor was not an obligate quadruped either, meaning it could walk about on two legs, therefore freeing up the arms for other purposes. Coupled with the hooked beak, the sharp claws and grasping hands may therefore be adaptations for tree climbing in Venetoraptor. Venetoraptor therefore shows that, around the time that true dinosaurs and pterosaurs were originating, there was a whole host of their relatives and precursors that were already remarkably diverse in their lifestyles and anatomy. An absolutely fantastic new discovery there then, and a very important one. And a big thank you to Santiago for sending me images and the press release of Venetoraptor to use in this video. Thank you very much, and congratulations to the team on such an amazing discovery. Also in the news is a very interesting investigation into the early evolution of the pinnipeds, the seals, sea lions, and walrus. This paper explains how the earliest pinnipeds would have inhabited terrestrial and freshwater systems, and how the whiskers of modern pinnipeds are used as a way for these animals to explore their underwater environments, and also to locate prey, by sensing vibrations. Well, this new research investigates how early pinnipeds would have used their whiskers, by looking at a certain region of the reconstructed brains of these animals, obtained through 3D scans of fossil skulls that preserve endocasts. Looking in particular at a stem pinniped called Potamotherium, the only freshwater inhabiting stem pinniped for which fossil brain endocasts have actually been found, the researchers discovered that the area of the brain associated with receiving sensory signals from the head and whiskers had an increased size in comparison to most terrestrial carnivorans. This region only appears to expand when a semi-aquatic or aquatic carnivoran uses its whiskers in the exploration of its environment. And so this shows that Potamotherium was most likely utilising its whiskers like modern pinnipeds do. So this discovery shows that this ability was already present in the earliest members of the true pinnipeds when they started making this adjustment to an aquatic environment, and it would almost certainly have greatly benefited them as they adapted and explored these new places. And finally, for the recent paleontology news, there was also the naming and description of a new species of dinosaur. Named Tharosaurus indicus, it's a new kind of sauropod dinosaur from the Middle Jurassic of India. Tharosaurus is known from several vertebrae fossils, and is very important in being the first ever decreosaurid to be found in India, as well as the oldest diplodocoid known from anywhere in the world, the major sauropod lineage including Diplodocus, Apatosaurus, Brontosaurus, and many others. Decreosaurids include species such as the well-known Amargosaurus, and Tharosaurus is found to represent a fairly early diverging member of this lineage. Looking at the context of this new species with other sauropods, the study suggests that Tharosaurus is a relic member of a lineage that had its beginnings in India before spreading out across Pangaea, therefore suggesting that India was actually a very important region in the evolution of major sauropod groups. Also, a big thank you to Dadino Nerdboy on DeviantArt for sending me his artwork of Tharosaurus to use in this video. Well, that's it from me for this week. Back to Dog in the Studio. 
Thank you, Ben. Well, that's it for this week's 7 Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed, and as always, we'll see you on Sunday.